My name is Rosemary Powell. I am the Executive Director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network. We have approximately uh, 109 members now that we're working with, uh, community groups and uh, organizations, labor groups and organizations, and social enterprises from across the City of Toronto. Um, so essentially they've come together on a platform of community benefits to look at how can we ensure that whenever there is an infrastructure project happening in our city that uh, people from underrepresented communities uh, like women, youth, urban aboriginals, veterans, newcomers, uh, racialized people can get access to the jobs and opportunities that are being created. Regardless of the fact that it's a booming industry, we still see that only 1.2% of racialized people actually make up this industry. We see 4.4% of women, 1.9% of urban aboriginals uh, making up the construction industry. We feel that this is an untapped pool of uh, talent that the unions are missing out on. We had leadership from the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, um, the Carpenters uh, Local 27. On our board of directors, we also have Layuna 183506, as well as the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. We're so pleased to see that our union partners, our union allies, also recognizes this and they want to be able to diversify uh, their union. They want to be able to diversify the, the, the industry and that's why they have partnered with the Toronto Community Benefits Network to bring to the table this concept of community benefits agreement using their tactics of negotiating uh, for good, decent jobs and benefits. They're bringing that as a concept to the community and letting the community know that you can actually bargain with uh, the decision makers. After all, this is your taxpayer dollars. Five years ago, we got organized uh, when the uh, Eglinton Crosstown LRT project was announced. Uh, the community recognized that uh, this was a significant investment of taxpayer dollars. We looked at it and thought, isn't this an incredible opportunity where we could look at um, supporting some of those, the people who lived in those communities to be able to access uh, the good jobs that are going to be created from this project. And so uh, what we did as a community coalition uh, was to uh, meet with Metrolinx. The community was able to get a commitment for 10% of all craft or trade working hours with Metrolinx. It was um, a, a consensus that we were able to develop in talking with the unions to look at what, uh, what is a reasonable uh, percentage of new intakes into the union that they would be able to support? Uh, the unions don't want to see their uh, industry flooded with you know, so many new entrants at this point. They want to make sure that whenever they bring someone in that they actually are able to guarantee them work. As a community, we were going for 15%. <laughs> and um, we felt that this was a minimum because when we looked at the city and we saw, especially in Toronto, that 51% of the city are now considered as racialized. And when we see 1.2% reflected in these uh, unions and in the construction industry, uh, we thought that this needed to change. They've been using uh, a recruitment structure where, uh, of referrals, referrals from family uh, into the unions for a very, very long time. They don't really have the expertise uh, of how to recruit from underrepresented groups, from these local neighborhoods. The Toronto Community Benefits Network, in partnership with all of our uh, you know, over 100 members uh, have a deep network into these uh, communities and so we do outreach where people are at. We meet them in the churches, in the mosque, we meet them at the restaurants and the malls, uh, we meet them in their community places and spaces and let them know about the opportunities and the process to be able to access these opportunities. The industry is, is dominated mainly by uh, white, male, um, Portuguese, Italians, <laughs> and so um, not many, uh, you know, historically disadvantaged communities like racialized people or actually have access into the union. It, it becomes uh, challenging for these uh, spaces to be able to welcome these new 
uh, community of immigrants, despite the fact that uh, many of these uh, spaces are also, you know, have immigrant backgrounds themselves. We've seen a quite a significant challenge, even as we roll out the Eglinton Crosstown uh, uh, Community Benefits uh, Program, uh, where the subcontractors are not as effective in, um, in following the, uh, the community benefits uh, uh, requirements. Uh, when the, uh, the, con the main contractor are able to hire directly, they've actually uh, done very well in meeting the 10% requirement. But right now, we're at a 3.4% um, uh, outcome. And we really see that the issue has been with the subcontractors. So they already have their existing workers, their crew uh, that they work with. And because of this um, process of, uh, that they've uh, historically used of hiring from their own, um, we've seen that um, there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, uh, openness uh, to being able to, to hire from these uh, new communities that make up Toronto. We have a, a program, a mentorship program for black youth because we've recognized that they experience double or triple um, the challenges that others do, which also includes, unfortunately, uh, discrimination and racism uh, while they're on the job site. There are nuances, there is, you know, there's a certain culture um, that, um, you know, you want to also be careful of and how do you navigate all of that for a new person who doesn't understand the industry? It's very challenging. And also, once you've gotten an opportunity to get into um, the trades and to be making good money, you don't want to mess that up. And sometimes you'll take certain things just to be able to get along, and it's not fair. And it has impacts inside of the workplace, uh, but also it has impacts at home and in the communities as well. What we got uh, after our demands for 10% and, and once the project uh, started to be built is what we call the schedule of the trades. An outline or a projection of what are going to be the in-demand trades uh, that are going to be needed on the project so that we can do that heavy lifting and the support that is needed to be able to prepare people to get into those trades. Ten of the largest unions and union training centers are members of the TCBN. We reach out to the community and they invite them into their training centers to see what it means to become a carpenter or to become an operating engineer or an electrician or a sheet metal worker. There are so many different trades out there and people really don't know. The industry is asking for more skilled workers. They want more skilled workers and they're willing to go uh, externally out of country to find people who can do the work. And what we're here saying is that, well, no, we have people right here. We have pockets within our community of people who's been historically left out of these opportunities who are ready and willing to work and all they need is an opportunity. There are over 50% of women uh, that make up the world, <laughs> that makes up our city, and that also makes up our workforce. And um, they deserve a space in the construction industry as well. We got to look at what are some of the issues and challenges for women in the industry that needs to be addressed to make it a more safe space and welcoming space for them. Being able to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning and for a woman, then she also has to find childcare and make sure that everybody is at home is okay before she can actually leave the house and be able to get to work. Are there opportunities in the industry that would allow women to have a more uh, flexible work schedule uh, that would accommodate her, um, uh, her responsibilities at home? Well, if not, is there opportunities for providing childcare centers closer to where she works? Safe space. When uh, you're working and you feel uncomfortable because um, you know, others are saying 
you know, sexist remarks uh, to you about your ability to be able to perform the job, it's demoralizing. How do we make sure that men understand that women can actually do this work? And many women don't know that they actually um, you know, can perform the types of work that is required uh, within the construction industry. And, you know, there's this myth and stereotype um, that is reinforced from the time that they are born. The types of, um, you know, education or schooling that she gets, um, you know, that, uh, that streams her into other types of, um, uh, you know, uh, careers uh, than construction. And it's a shame. It's a real missing opportunity. I think that if the construction industry looked at this and said, here is an opportunity, and they look at it in terms of you know, finding solutions and finding the best worker uh, for the jobs instead of reinforcing old stereotypes, um, they um, uh, would uh, be the better for it.